expected. Amen. Let us go into the word of God. How many are ready for the word? Uh, we're going we're gonna to have an interesting topic today. Some of you probably saw it and like, oh, Lord. And people don't like to talk about this topic, but we're going to talk about something interesting today. But I'm going to have you open up in the Gospel of Luke, if you will. Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. We're going to read out of the 23rd chapter. We're going to read verses 42 and 43. I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation, and you could read in whatever version you have. And it's a familiar story. It's a familiar passage. But we're going to talk about something in an interesting context today out of this passage. When you have it, just say amen. Amen. For those of you at home, hopefully you already have this. We're going to read this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the Church of Christ says, amen. And then it says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. One more time. And, G and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. May God add holy blessing onto his word. You may be seated. Hallelujah in the house of God. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about an interesting sermon title for today, but I always like to do a review. So if you weren't here last week, if you missed it, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, Pop Church English Ministry, search for us, subscribe to it, click on the bell, click on like, so that way you'll get updates. We always re put on the rebroadcast and the recordings of the sermons on the YouTube channel, and you can follow us and watch the re, kind of replay the whole service on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page, same thing, Pop Church English Ministry. But if you missed it last week, last week's message was message of the handkerchief. It was Resurrection Sunday. It was Easter. Amen. And we spoke about uh, basically how sometimes we, we may miss out on the complete revelation of what Easter truly is, of what Resurrection Sunday truly is. And we miss out on that total message of Christ's resurrection because we limit our focus to the empty tomb and not look at what Christ left behind in the tomb. But John and Peter, as we said last week, both arrived at the tomb, and John, though, out of the, although they both went to the tomb, John, we said last week, stayed on the outside, and he stooped down and looked in, while Peter entered completely inside of the tomb. Here, Peter represents, we said, that uh, what happens when we completely go all in to God's presence and all in in our service and our relationship with the Lord. That is why John did not get the same revelation that Peter got and Peter received. John could not see or receive the complete blessing because he stayed outside of the tomb, we said, and he was looking in from the outside. And John represents the religious mindset of man. We said how man always tries to stay on the outside, looking in, trying to, trying to stay on the outer extremities, trying to use external actions to try to bring about change for internal condition of sin and trying to reach God without completely committing to his presence. And we said that this is not about religion. We spoke about what we preach in the gospel has nothing to do with religion, but has everything to do with an intimate and passionate relationship with God. How many say amen? And we said that religion or that mentality of staying on the outside and looking in kills the total revelation of God. But the relationship, the all in with the Lord, the going in completely into his presence provokes revelation of his love, of God's true nature, of his will. And it unleashes his blessing, his favor, and God's anointing and his everlasting life in our lives. How many say amen with me? And Peter completely went into the tomb, as we saw. And he said, and we said last week that not only did he see the linen cloths, because he went into the tomb, he was always, always also able to see the handkerchief. And the linen cloths were used to wrap what? See, there's a difference between the two things. The linen cloths, we said last week, wrapped up the body of Christ, right? It was used to wrap from his neck down. It wrapped the main torso, the chest, the abdomens, the arms, the legs, the hand, and the feet. Where the major and vital organs were that keep us alive, with all that represents the sustenance 
victor. They don't see victor. They see the face of Jesus looking back at them. They see the face of love looking back. And somebody help me praise God in the house of the Lord. That when they see you, they see the image of Jesus Christ looking back. Can somebody praise him in the house? Hmm. That is the message of the handkerchief. We need to be like the handkerchief that was left in that tomb, an image, a reflection of the face of God, a monument of hope, of healing, of love, of eternal life in Jesus Christ. But today's sermon, we go from resurrection and life, today's sermon title is Thoughts in in the Hour of Death. Lord, Pastor, you went dark. Hallelujah. Well, it's a gray day outside. Isn't it appropriate how the weather matches the text, or excuse me, the, the, the title of today's sermon, Thoughts in the Hour of Death. We go from talking about life and resurrection totally to the other extreme of the spectrum. <laughs> and especially now, where the times that we're living, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. We just lost a few people additionally to this ministry that passed on, that transitioned on to be with God in his presence in heaven due to this virus. We are fighting and battling through this pandemic where we're surrounded by death. (laughs) And we all can probably and have probably have thought about that time probably reaching ourselves or someone in our in our household we probably have had thoughts about what would we do if we were facing that impending hour and time of our of our death. The Bible teaches us, church, that we should be thinking about that moment. But not like the world thinks, because there's a difference between how the world without Christ sees death and how the church of Christ sees death. How many say amen? But look at what the Bible tells me. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles handy today. Hebrews 9, 27, out of the Living Translation says, And just as each person is destined to die once... And after that comes judgment. In other words, everybody was, was, that was born from a womb on this earth is destined to die physically. It's coming. There's no way around it. Some of us will, will leave this earth before others. <laughs> other than Jesus Christ himself, absolutely nobody can defeat death, can bypass death, or can circumvent death. Look at what Ecclesiastes tells us. Chapter 8, verse 8, New Living Translation. The Bible says none of us can hold back our spirit from departing. Clearly, it says none of us can beat death. So verse 8 of chapter 8 of Ecclesiastes, none of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. There is no escaping that obligation, that dark battle. And in the face of death, wickedness will certainly not rescue the wicked. Hallelujah. Only the transition and the rapture of the church, you need to understand this, will free the saints. There are many saints, there are many believers, even people probably in our own families that have believed in Christ, that have had them as their Lord and Savior, that have transitioned on to be in the presence of God. And only those saints that have gone before us by the rapture and the transition of the church from here on earth into heaven will all those believers that have died before us be freed from their physical death here on earth. Look at what the Bible says. First Thessalonians. 4, 15 through 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 through 17. New King James. I'm going to read this out of the New King James, by the way. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first, it says. And then who we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be 
with the Lord. How many can praise God for that incoming moment? How many are willing and waiting and anxiously declaring that Jesus is coming soon? Can I get a praise in the house of God if you are desiring for the coming of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. One of the praises that we used to declare in the church I pastored in Florida was Maranatha. It was a word that means Jesus come soon. It's not that he is going to come. No, we're telling Christ, I'm ready. My bags are packed. I'm ready to go home. How many say praise the Lord? There should be nothing in this earthly life that doesn't want you to be in the presence of your God. I know we love our family. I know I love my wife. I love my grandbaby. I love all my kids. But I love Jesus and God above everything and everyone else. Is there anybody in the, in the church that understands what I'm talking about? And if it's my time to go, I don't fear death. Well, don't get me wrong. Pastor, I, I, I don't want to die yet. Your body instinctively tries to protect itself from harm. That's an instinct that God has given us to value the life that he has given us here on earth. But if it's my time to go, I'm ready. Oh, my God. I am so ready to go. And if God is going to come before I close my eyes naturally and the trumpet sounds, I desire to hear the trumpet so that I could be caught up in heaven and raised up to be in his presence for an eternity. Can somebody praise him with me in the house of the Lord? But in that context, I want to discuss with you the thoughts that we all can and some of us may have about death and even about the impending hour of our death. It's that word we used to call in Spanish, the, the cuckoo word, the, the scary word, the boogeyman word. We don't want to talk about death, but we need to. Because when you serve Jesus Christ, when Christ is the Lord of your life, death is just a transition. It's a simple passage from this life to an eternal life in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Here in our central text that we just read for this sermon, we do not see death at a distance, but it's something that's right there, right in the moment. There's three people crucified on Mount Calvary on crosses about to die. It's near, it's at hand. And many of those that are hearing this sermon, or many of us that are going to hear this, or many people that we may know have rejected eternal life because they've simply rejected and not been willing to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And unfortunately, those people are disciples of death and not disciples of life in Christ. But we see here that on the cross of Calvary, there were two other people. Although in this text that we read, we see the conversation between Jesus and one of those other three, two people that were on the, on the cross crucified with him. See, a lot of these people that the one rejected the message of salvation and the other one accepted, acknowledged, and declared Jesus as his savior. Right on Mount Calvary. And we're going to go into detail in that. <laughs> those that deny Jesus, that reject Jesus... They try to deny death. They try to negotiate God with religion uh, to overcome it. They try, they, some of them even go ragefully against death and throw a campaign of I'm going to live life like it's my last day. Because they know that after this life, they're going to live in eternal damnation and death. They even try to use religion to bypass it. Until they finally have to come to have no choice but simply accept the fact that death is going to come. And at the time of death, many of us can have thoughts come into our minds. See, this, this thief that was on the cross had some thoughts come into his mind as he's on the cross about to die next to Jesus. Have you ever thought about what you would possibly think in my moment of death? Have you ever thought about, gee, what, what, what would I be feeling? How, how, what would I say? What would I think? What thoughts would come into my mind as a pastor and even as just a, a, a normal person seeing some of my loved ones being at their deathbeds, there's a saying, and, and, and there are many people that believe and say that you can tell and you can see the true colors of a person when they're on their deathbed by listening to what they say and what thoughts come into their mind and what they declare. Some of us may think, well, what will become of my family? Some people may have thoughts questioning, will I ever even be remembered? Uh, some may wonder, who will my death affect the most in my family? Some 
we'll, we'll probably ask and, and think, well, will it take courage to say goodbye to this world? Some may even ask, am I spiritually prepared for eternity? Some of us may even wonder, do I have communion and true relationship with Jesus? And some may ask that all-important question, where will I spend eternity after I die? See, the thief on the cross, this thief specifically, is known, is known as the very first convert from Calvary. And he made a 180 degree turnaround at his crucifixion and turned his face to the crucified divine lamb of God when he reprimanded the other arrogant and defiant thief. See, we see two different thought processes happening at Calvary. One thief defied Jesus. One thief challenged Jesus. One thief arrogantly demanded that Jesus act on his behalf. Yet this thief declared Jesus with his thoughts and his words as the son of God and his savior. <laughs> he had an interesting set of thoughts in his hour of death. And today I want to look at those thoughts. Those thoughts in the hour of death from the cross of Calvary. And the powerful message, model, and lesson that they contain for the church of Christ today. So 2,000 years ago. Those thoughts that came into those minds on Calvary have a powerful teaching and lesson for us here today in the church of God here on earth. And I'm going to go into that with you. My first point, if you're following and taking notes, I encourage you to take notes. My first point, hallelujah, is going to be this thief. He thought of Jesus. First point, he thought of Jesus. How? When he declared, remember See, he set his gaze on Jesus. He set his gaze on Jesus when he was on the cross on Calvary. And he said to Jesus, remember. That was the first word. We read it. He confessed Jesus in his heart as his Savior and his Lord. And we see them in the powerful words that he declared in his thought process in the final moments when he was facing death. Look at verse 40. Look at what he said first, and I'm going to go jump ahead. We started at 42, but I want us to go to verse 40 of that same chapter of Luke. Luke 23, verse 40, and we're going to read down to 40, 42. And he says, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die. And he's talking to the thief, the arrogant thief. We deserve to die, he says, for our crimes. <laughs> but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Verse 41. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We truly, when we are truly have Jesus as our Lord and Savior of our lives, it is manifested in the hardest, darkest, and most difficult and painful times of our life. How many believe that? When Jesus Christ is truly your Lord and he's truly your Savior and you have him on the throne of your heart in your most hardest, difficult, ugliest, darkest, painful moments of your life, that's when it's manifested. That's when you reveal that by the way you act and what you speak and what you do. How many believe that with me in the house of the Lord? Thinking of Jesus in our hour of death and thin, this th thinking about Jesus in that hour and moment of his death was more important to him than thinking about anything else. He could have thought about a thousand other things. He could have thought about his family. He could have thought about his friends. He could have thought about uh, the world that he was leaving behind. He could have thought about the other person on the cross that was actually going through the same stuff that he was going through. <laughs> the inspired writer of Ecclesiastes thundered a powerful message with the following words. Look at what Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, and I'm going to read this out of New King James. It says, remember now your creator in the days of your what? Youth. Interesting. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Many believe that, well, I don't got to worry about God. I got a whole life ahead of me. I'll worry about God when I'm old, right before I die, so that I can make sure I go to heaven. But it says, remember your creator now in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. 
Now when you have all your strength, now when you have all your, your, your ability to do for God and give God the best of your life, now is when you need to think about God. Now is when you need to serve God. Now is when you need to, to worship the Lord with everything that you have and everything that you, you've got because you got to understand nothing that you have is yours. Somebody praise him in the house of the Lord. If God has blessed you with talents and abilities, it's because he has made you a steward and administrator of that ability to exalt and glorify and minister unto the Lord. Can somebody help me and praise him in the house of God? You got to understand something. Man without God is living in spiritual exile. When you go through life living without God and saying, I don't need God, you are putting yourself in spiritual exile. You're, you're, you're separating yourself from God and everything that he can offer and bless you with. You can have everything in this world, pleasures, money, fame, everything. <laughs> but if God is missing in your life, you will have to eventually confess there is no pleasure in these things. We've seen countless examples in the Bible. We see that the Bible even says that everything in life is just the vanity of vanities. And this is coming from a man that had everything. He was the king. King Solomon said, everything is just vanity. Everything on this earth passes away. So many people struggle to obtain things that will be corruptible, that will be left behind. See, senior pastor this morning in Spanish ministry said the same thing. We are so busy spending everything we've got trying to get that awesome car, trying to get the bigger house, trying to advance our life materially. But all those things will pass away when we should be investing in the kingdom of heaven. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? The word of God says, seek ye him first, the kingdom of heaven first, and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. All these things eventually will become and come to a point in our lives where we won't even have pleasure in them anymore. We'll be trying to fill a hole with material things that only God and his Holy Spirit and love can fill. The thief thought about Jesus first. He cried out to him and said, remember. And now I come to my second point. The thief also taught about himself because he didn't just stop with the word remember he also declared me remember me he thought of himself he thought of God and then he thought of himself but he thought of himself not selfishly there's a difference <laughs> the looking at Jesus when he was looking at Jesus the thief was able to see into himself oh somebody when you look at into the face of Jesus Christ, when you look right into the mirror of God's word, it reveals stuff about you and God and God in you to yourself. Did you know that? When I look into God's presence, when I come and seek his face, his word, his presence, and his Holy Spirit tells and reveals things about myself to me. Do you know that God knows you, than you that better than you know yourself? There's stuff that we don't even know about ourselves that when we start going into his word, when we start seeking his presence, when we start allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to our lives through his word and through us seeking his face, he starts to reveal stuff about us. We start learning things about ourselves that we didn't even know. And that's what happened with this thief. Jesus of Nazareth reveals to us the most intimate and secret regions of our own hearts and of our own minds. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Before the, 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 the stature and the presence of the Holy One, before the Holy Lamb of God, the sinner, the man without God, looks small. You can't compare and measure up to Christ. You can't compare and measure up to God. God without man is small. God is the Almighty God, the one that fills the universe. <laughs> Before the great I am, before the king of kings, before the Lord of lords, the Lord, the sinner has to recognize what he truly and really is. He is useless. He is meaningless without God in his life. 
And in the hour of death, even when thinking of himself, this thief, when he was thinking about himself, it wasn't in an arrogant attitude. It wasn't in a selfish and egotistical mindset or an entitlistic mindset. It came from a position of acknowledgement of his own unworthiness and acknowledging who Christ truly was. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? How do I know this? Pastor, how can you say this? Well, look at the verses we read in the central text. It says in verse 41, the thief declared, we deserve to die for our crimes. Do you understand, church, that nobody that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb bought and paid for that blood? Did you know that? Nothing you could do can buy your salvation. Nothing you can say, or actually, there is something you can say, by declaring and humbling yourself. But nothing that you can do or give to God will buy your way into heaven. It's only by the grace and mercy and favor of God that we have access to the blood of the lamb that was shed on the cross of Calvary for you and for me that gives us the everlasting life for those that believe in him. He said it. We deserve to die. It was from a position of humbleness, of self-acknowledgement. But this man, he says in verse 41, this man, referring to Jesus, hasn't done anything wrong. He knew that Jesus was taking on death. He that was without sin was becoming sin. He who was the life, the truth, and the way was becoming death and conquering. Oh, so I get emotional when I think about Jesus because he took on death so that I can have life. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? And in the hour of death, many of us will have different thoughts run through our minds. We can have many thoughts in that hour. But the two most important thoughts that should be in our minds during that time. One, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And that we need to die with Jesus by our side. If I'm leaving this earth, I want to leave with Jesus right there with me. How glorious it is, church, to know that in the hour of the death of you as a believer, as me as a believer, as a child of the living God, when Jesus is the Lord of your life, in the moment of your death, you will see Jesus directly in the flesh, face to, oh, somebody should be praising God right now. You're going to see him face to face. His angels are going to come and accompany you into the presence of Jesus of Nazareth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's is anybody praising God because we have that blessing in Jesus? My third point. He thought of eternity. When he declared, when you come into your kingdom. Those were the words that he said. He was thinking at that point. His thought was of eternity. He who was crucified and repentant and saved by the divine crucified son of God, this thief, had a vision in his heart of eternity. This thief was known as the very first convert from Calvary. He converted instantly. He became a Christian on the cross. Before the disciples, he was a Christian. Oh, somebody. Did you know that? This thief, a thief. He wasn't even somebody that was following Jesus. Look at how God does stuff. Oh, somebody tell, oh, you ain't worth nothing. Oh, yo, you spent, you wasted your life. You ain't worth nothing to God. Yet this thief that did everything wrong all of his life was destined to die, was, was, was sentenced to death because of his criminal background. Yet he was, had the privilege and blessing of being the very first Christian. Oh, the very first believer, the very first convert that was brought to the presence of God through Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary was this thief, this lowly humbling this this person that had no value to society that was the person that received the blessing of being the very first christian on jesus christ through the cross of calvary can somebody praise god because it ain't about who you are it's about who jesus is somebody 
It isn't about titles. It isn't about what you did wrong. It's about acknowledging that you did wrong and that you repent from your wrong and that Jesus is the only way, that he is the, 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 the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody could come to the Father if it not be through him. <laughs> that thief that was repentant, that was crucified, that had a vision of Jesus and the eternity in his heart. He was able to receive the revelation of eternality through Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. When Christ is in our heart, the Holy Spirit reveals and speaks to our spirit about who we are and what we have in Jesus. Did you know that? But pastor, there are days that I don't even feel like I'm saved. There are days that I don't even feel like Jesus is in my life. But the Romans 8, 16 says the following, New King James Version, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If your emotions, if your mind doesn't feel like it, then call on the Holy Spirit of God. Say, Holy Spirit, testify. Bear witness to my heart right now. I need to know and I need to feel you in my life so that I know that I am a true child of the living God. <laughs> and in this moment on the cross, we see, we see the duality. We see this, this scale of suffering, present suffering versus future hope. This, this man was not only dying, he was suffering a painful, a very, a very uncomfortable uh, 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 death that was suffering, that was full of pain on the cross of Calvary alongside of Jesus. <laughs> he had a present suffering. For the converted thief, the present life with its suffering and its failures and its misfortune and its consequences was replaced by the hope of the second coming of Jesus and his kingdom. Look at what Romans 8, 18 tells us. Yet we suffer now. What we suffer now is what? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing that you're going through right now in this life, church. Nothing that you're suffering, no tears that you have shed, the pains that you have gone through, the betrayal that you've gone through. It says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. What is that glory? The eternal life in heaven, the blessings that God has for us. How many can praise the name of the Lord? Church, the greater your suffering now, the greater the glory and blessing in your life later by the hand of God. Can somebody praise him for that? Hallelujah. Oh, pastor, I'm going through some stuff right now. Then I tell you this, if he's got you going through some heavy stuff, then the blessing that you're going to have in the future is going to be greater than the suffering that you got now. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? <laughs> Psalms 30, even the Psalms, the psalmist declares, verse, verse 5 30th chapter of Psalms, where he says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. <laughs> Through faith in Christ and his word, we must be able to see eternity flourishing in our present life. We must see Jesus of Nazareth as already taking his rightful place from being on the cross to sitting on the throne of heaven as the king of kings and lords of lords. Religion tries to keep Jesus on the cross. I don't want to single out anybody, but there are churches where you'll see a crucifix and Jesus on the cross, still nailed on that cross. The image of that crucified Jesus is what they look at as the semblance, as the image of Christ. But my image of Christ is an empty cross. Oh, somebody. You see, the symbol of the empty cross is not a symbol of condemnation as many preach. Oh, you shouldn't have an image of a cross on you or near you or, or, or wearing a cross that's empty on your neck because that's a symbol of condemnation. No, for the Christian, for the true believer, for the one that has Christ as their Lord and Savior, the empty cross is a sign of victory, is a sign of life, is a sign of resurrection because that Jesus that was on the cross is no longer on the cross and is at the right hand of the Heavenly Father reigning and interceding and working for my good. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? In my fourth point, he thought of security. He thought of security in that hour of death when Jesus declared to him, I assure you, assure, 
He's guaranteeing. That's what that word says. I assure you. I guarantee you. Today, not tomorrow, not in the future, not maybe afterwards or when I come back and come from my church. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Hmm. See, it was a gentleman's agreement. Have you ever heard that phrase? How many have heard that phrase? A gentleman's agreement. Have you ever heard that? What does that mean? What is a gentleman's agreement? If you look at the definition of that phrase... It's a saying that represents an informal and often unwritten agreement or transaction backed by the integrity of the two parties. Huh. That they will actually abide and fulfill the terms of the agreement. So it's a word of honor. It's, it, it's a gentleman's agreement. It's a handshake. Back in the old days, they didn't have contracts and they didn't, you didn't have to fill and sign out 50 forms. You would just shake on it and that was the gentleman's agreement that you were giving your word that you were going to fulfill and abide by the agreement that, were, that was made between those two parties. And we see here on the cross that a gentleman's agreement took place. <laughs> An agreement as this generally is informal and made verbally and is not legally binding. But over the years, I've heard, and I don't know if you guys have heard this, many preachers have referred to Jesus as the gentleman of the cross. Have you heard that? In Spanish, el caballero de la cruz. I'm not speaking in tongues for those that don't understand Spanish. I'm speaking in Spanish. Sorry. The gentleman of the cross. He's referred to that. Why? Why do we call Jesus the gentleman of the cross? Because Jesus is a true gentleman. <laughs> he is God. But he doesn't impose himself, nor will he obligate you to follow or to accept him. He doesn't impose himself on anyone. Look at Revelation, what it says about how a gentleman Jesus is. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, New King James. I'm going to read this out of. If you have your Bibles, look it up. We will have it on the screen. Behold, this is Jesus speaking. I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, this is an interesting passage, an interesting text, church, because as Jesus knocks on the door, and it doesn't say knocks. If you look at the original verbiage of this, word, of this text, of the scripture, it implies that he has been standing. When you look at the original language, literally translated, it says, I have been standing, I will be standing, and I am standing, and I have been knocking, and I will continue to knock at the door. In other words, he is waiting for you and for us to voluntarily open, acknowledge, and open the door of our hearts. And it says that once we open the door, I will come into him. Interesting choice of words. So when we open the doors of our hearts and say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, he comes into us, dwells in us, and takes position on the throne of our heart. And he says, I will dine with him. Oh, oh, I, I, could, I could preach a sermon just on this passage when it says dining. That's God providing provision, sustenance. Oh, and it ain't going to just be a happy meal from McDonald's. When God and Jesus shows up and dines with you, you're going to have a five-star, 12-course, oh, a luxurious meal and banquet awaiting for you through the hands of Jesus Christ. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? He says, I will dine with him and he with me. <laughs> Jesus knocks and waits for us to open the door of our hearts voluntarily. He doesn't barge down the door. He doesn't knock the door down. He doesn't break it down. He patiently waits as a true gentleman. He has the power to remove a stone or, or to tell the storm, be still. He has the power, and he was the power. He was the word that in the beginning said, let there be life, and there was light. Yet that almighty power will not obligate itself into your heart. He waits as a true gentleman. Jesus, as the divine gentleman, waits for us to open our hearts. And the same divine gentleman was on the cross and gave his word of honor to that thief. On the cross, who declared him his Lord and Savior. Huh. 
and gave that thief the honor of being the converted thief on the cross, the very first convert. And he promised him something that Jesus would fulfill that very day. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Hmm. Although Jesus would fulfill his promise that day, Jesus actually gave him an eternal promise. Do you know that? Because it says, you're going to be with me today. But it wasn't just going to be for a day. It was from here, from that point, and in eternity. He's up there in heaven, joy, enjoying the presence and praising God and on the throne of heaven, praising and giving Jesus worship and praise. Can somebody praise him in the house? And that's the honor that you and I have. That's the honor of our family members that have gone before us, that have passed on to eternity by dying in this physical corruptible body and taking on new life and continuing the perfect life of heavenly everlasting life in the presence of heaven, in the presence of God. In our death, salvation cannot be doubted, church. In the moment of our death, in the hour of our death, we can't have doubts about our salvation. <laughs> Why? Because it has been gifted and guaranteed by Jesus Christ, the divine gentleman of the cross. He guaranteed salvation. Today, I assure you. He didn't just say today. He says, I assure you. Huh, I guarantee it. He guaranteed it and signed it in his blood. Oh somebody hallelujah he signed the contract of eternal life with his very blood and he's putting the stamp of the holy spirit on it and he ratified it and validated when he resurrected on the third day from the tomb as we celebrated last week on the sunday of resurrection and when jesus is our savior death in this life should be our greatest joy pastor that's hard that's hard but it's the truth. It is the source of joy because we know that death in this life means being present in our heavenly home. Do you know that this is not your home? How many know that? Some of us, some of our brothers and sisters are considered undocumented. <laughs> undocumented aliens or undocumented immigrants. We're all undocumented immigrants. Whether you're a citizen of the United States or not. Because if you serve God and you believe in Jesus... This is not, our citizenship is not here on earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. Can somebody praise him? That is your true home. That is your true citizenship. And being absent in this life means that we are present in our eternal and heavenly home before the throne of heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, New Living Translation says, yes, we are fully confident. This is, what, this is what Paul is telling the Corinthians. We are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. New King James says that absent from these bodies means being present with the Lord. Our salvation in Jesus Christ guarantees our heavenly residence. Hallelujah. But that salvation is not acquired through works, church. Salvation is not about what we do to be saved, but what Jesus has done for us to be saved. How many say amen? And to conclude, church, facing the hour of death is made easier with the presence of Jesus Christ, with a relationship with the almighty God. Psalms 23. Many of us have that as the, the psalm of the dead. No, this is the psalm of the living. We recite this psalm in funeral services. But in reality, this is a promise for those that are not already dead. Those are, uh, these are promises for those that are here on earth still living, that believe in God. And verse 4 specifically of Psalms 23 in New King James says the following. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When we walk with the certainty of where we will be 
when we die, when we come to the hour of our death, when we understand that death is a transition to our permanent eternal residence in heaven, then we fear no evil. We can walk through death itself. We can walk through the valley and know regardless of God liberating me from the danger or allowing me to die and shed this earthly body, I know that it's all for my good because whether I live here or I'm in heaven, I'm going to be with Jesus and in the presence of God for an eternity. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? Where will I spend my eternity? That's what many people are asking. And it's a question that every human being needs to ask him or herself, church. (laughs) Am I going to be in heaven? (laughs) Most people think they're going to go to heaven because, well, yeah, I'm good because I've been in church for 15 years. Or, or I'm good because I've been teaching Sunday school for 20 years. Or, or I'm good because I'm on the worship ministry. Or I'm good, I don't need to worry about it because I've been in ministry, I've been pastoring, I've been doing this, and I've been a missionary for over 20 years. But the true question, the true answer to the question of where you will spend eternity is not about what you've been doing or doing or how long you've been in church or not in church. It's whether Jesus truly is the Lord of your life. Does Jesus truly sit on the throne of your heart? Church, stand up with me in the house. Stand up with me in the sanctuary. Listen to me. This is not about who you are or what you do in church. This is about where and who Jesus is in you. I'm going to say that again. Write that down. This is not about who you are or what you do in church. This is about where and who Jesus is in you, where he is in your life, and who he is in your life. It is a question that can only be answered truly. That question of where will I spend eternity can only truly be answered if Jesus sits on the throne of your heart as your Lord and Savior. For you to answer that question... You, you have to make sure that he's there. And if he's there and he's not just your savior, but he is truly your Lord, then your answer should be a resounding in heaven. That's where I'm going to spend eternity. If Jesus is not the Lord of your life, then sadly, the answer is, and not many people like to hear this word, and we don't hear this word from the pulpits anymore. But if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, your eternity will be spent in hell. Bottom line. I'm sorry if I offended somebody. I'm sorry if if I'm speaking too much truth. But the Bible, in fact, as being a pastor and minister of the Lord, I am obligated, I am bound by an oath to say the truth and preach the truth and preach nothing but the truth. And either you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no halfway. There's no in-between. There's no warm. Either you're hot or you're cold. If you try to play the warm route, the Bible tells me that those that are warm, that are half in and out, he will vomit them he will spit them from his mouth but those that have made a commitment to serve him to be all in with Jesus not on the outside looking in like John tried to do but all in up in the tomb with the presence of God giving God all you got giving him everything you are those are the people that will be able to say I will spend eternity in heaven with my heavenly father (laughs) especially now that we are battling and fighting through this pandemic, and where we have been surrounded by all this death, I need to ask you, and those that are listening to my voice, whether it's on the replay or live, where will you spend eternity? Is Jesus, the gentleman of the cross, truly sitting on the throne of your heart? I need you to, under, I don't know why God put this message in my heart. And I, I felt like if I didn't preach this today, somebody, something was going to go wrong. Somebody was going to miss out. And then God was going to hold me accountable. But somebody that's listening to me, whether you're online or here in the sanctuary, you need to put him on the throne. You've been looking outside in like John did. You've been on the outside letting God just work on some parts of your life. But God says, I need you to be all in with me. I need you to give me the throne of your heart. Can somebody praise him? In the house of the Lord, I need to be the one in your life that controls you, that goal, that shapes you, that forms you with my word and my spirit. Somebody praise him. Oh, hallelujah. I need to be the priority. And if I'm on the throne of your life, then you will be in my throne, praising me and worshiping me for an eternity. (laughs) 
Maybe you've been in church for many years or even active in ministry. <laughs> Trying to keep Jesus as your savior, but not really having them as your Lord then I invite you to let Jesus take his rightful place in your life. And I'm not judging you today. I'm not condemning you today because the word of God is the one that can judge and condemn, and only he can do that. But I beseech you, I beg you, I, I don't know why I feel a desperation that you need to make a decision today, not tomorrow, not after you leave. This is your moment. Somebody is getting something. Can somebody help me praise God? Because I feel a, 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 a desperation that someone is at the thread, uh, is hanging by the thread of the mercy of God. And God has allowed you to bypass death once and twice. But that moment is coming when you have to face death and God says where do you want to be in your eternity <laughs> let Jesus take his place as the Lord of your life Romans 10 9 Paul made it very clear if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord first I'm reading out of New Living Trains, a New Living Translation. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. First step, he's got to be Lord. And then he'll become your savior. If you haven't done that, then I beseech you today to make a decision for Christ. How many got a word from God today? If God spoke to you, just raise your hand right where you're at. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. If God spoke to you at home, then put in the comment, I received my word. I got my word today, Pastor. If you are that person and you don't need to divulge it on the comments or here in the sanctuary, but if you're that person that had had Jesus as your Savior but not truly as your Lord, then today you're going to make a decision. Today is your day where you give Jesus the rightful place in your heart and say, God, here it is. I dust it off. I take myself off the throne and I put you on hallelujah oh ha. and you're going to repeat this prayer we say this every week and I need you to say this with me today loud and proud hallelujah that you're going to declare Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior and we're going to say the sinner's prayer together and the prayer says heavenly father I come before you and I know that I am a sinner and I truly repent and ask you to forgive me of all my sins and I accept the sacrifice of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross of Calvary, where he shed his blood for me to wash me of all my sins. And I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. And I declare Jesus Christ as the Lord of my heart. <laughs> and I accept him as the savior of my soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and the church says a resounding amen. Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus Christ a hand clap offering in the house of God? Because I know somebody has said that prayer, and I declare that by faith, they are a born-again Christian. If you said that, and you said it with all belief and faith in your heart, hallelujah, then you are a new creation and a child of God. You are a brother and sister in Christ. Welcome to the family and the body of Christ. Can somebody praise him in the house of God today? Hallelujah. How many were blessed? How many were blessed? Hallelujah. I was blessed. If you were blessed, give them a round of applause in the house of God for thanksgiving and praise. And if you accepted Jesus, I encourage you to find a Bible-based church where you can congregate and worship and be fed spiritually and edified through the word of God. And if you don't have one, we would love to be your home church. We would love to be your pastors. We are a multicultural ministry. Uh, we're here in Far Rockaway, Queens, New York City area. So if you're in the five towns, JFK, Queens area, come down and see us, 1835 Mott Avenue, every Sunday, 3 p.m. How many were blessed in the Lord? Hallelujah. I was blessed. God has blessed me with this word. I hope you were blessed at home for those that are watching and those here in the sanctuary. And I will dismiss you today. How many are ready, hallelujah, to have Jesus on the throne of your heart? Even if you already got him there. Just, just say, Christ, Jesus, I just want to dust it off a little bit and make sure that you're there. Hallelujah. Every day, just check it and make sure that it's not you, that Jesus is the one on the throne of your heart. And if he's there, then you can have the guarantee, hallelujah, that come what may, whether you're in this life or the next, you are being for an eternity in the presence of the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ himself. Amen.
Amen. So let me dismiss you. I will give you the final blessing. Guys, next Sunday, be ready. We got another word. God has given me a few messages, sermons for the next few weeks. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the walk of a true child of God. The walk of a true child of God. Guys, you don't want to miss it. It's, a, it's an awesome word. And I think God is already blessing me with it. I know he's going to bless you. Invite your friends. Bring family. We got a few of our people out traveling still for the holidays. They're coming back this week. So we expect to see a, a semi-full house next week. Praise the Lord in, the, in faith. And for those that are at home, we love you. We bless you. I will dismiss you with the final blessing of the day. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and have mercy on you. May the, may the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you true peace. I now bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the church of Jesus Christ says amen. We love you. We bless you. We'll see you next week, 3 p.m. Be blessed, guys.